workers of this Mississippi shipyard have a killer task. Okay, hold that. To thrash this heavy metal into a new kind of oil rig. A monster that defies hurricanes and preys on deep oil. I watch it. But time is running out. It becomes a nightmare. And one false move could prove fatal. It can be very dangerous with the weight that we're picking up. Not just for these guys. Cable. But for every man on the rig. Our lives are totally dependent on how this structure is made. Mistakes in the shipyard will end up in the unforgiving sea. Right now on Extreme Engineering. Six AM Vicksburg, Mississippi. It's heading toward ninety degrees. Gonna be a scorcher. At the Laterno shipyard, this massive hull is the base of a new breed of oil rig. Monsters like this jack-up rig are the workhorses of the oil world. Here's how the design works. After it's dragged to a drilling site, powerful motors drive the legs down into the seafloor, then jack up the entire rig above the reach of hurricane waves. Next, the derrick slides into position and the workers begin to drill. Pumping a weighted sweep right now, so you're gonna be getting a whole, whole, whole lot of trash and stuff back. You might start losing a little bit of mud. If they hit oil, they'll cap the well, jack the rig down, and then tow it to its next location. And a permanent drilling platform will take over pumping the oil. This is one of Laterno's Gorilla Class rigs. A 32,000 ton beast engineered to withstand the tortures of the North Sea. At the shipyard, the company is building a whole new class of rigs, similar to the Gorilla, but with even greater drilling muscle and a more economical, compact form. Tarzan class rigs are designed to find deep oil in the Gulf of Mexico, where the shallow oil has already been found. The Tarzan can drill over seven miles down, a depth most other rigs can only dream of. They've already built one Tarzan. They need to crank out three more. Stake, a huge advantage in the race for deep gulf oil. It's production manager Bodie Massey's job to build the second Tarzan. Hold on it over there, Bernie. Time is running out. Coming down. Bodie and his team have just 10 months to turn these thousands of huge pieces Get out there. into a lean, mean drilling machine.
so far they've built the inner walls of the rig's hull. A triangle, each side the length of a hockey rink, with a hole at each corner for the legs. A drilling derrick still needs to be built, along with living quarters for the crew, a helipad, and three legs to hold up the hull. Tarzan rigs can earn a hundred grand a day. But as long as the rig is unfinished, it isn't making money, it's costing money. The first Tarzan came in at 110 million bucks. The cost of two Boeing 737s. Bodie's under orders to nail this one for 20 million less. Uh, you gotta go to the other side, Roosevelt. Damn to the other side. To stay on budget, Bodie's gotta stay on schedule. Different things can get you behind, not having the materials, not having drawings on time. Also, weather has some condition on us. If we start falling behind, you can get into trouble real quick. Hey, Mac. It's tough to make a jack-up rig, but it's even tougher to move one. Once we get the rig in complete condition, we use its legs and mechanical jacking units to walk it into the Mississippi River. They walk the rig by raising and lowering the legs. And sliding the hull on huge mounds of dirt. About a hundred feet a day. Tugboats will pull the rig 400 miles downriver, where workers will attach the drilling derrick, add on more sections to the legs, and tow it out into the gulf above a likely oil deposit. When it's jacked up, the rig's 15,000 ton weight will bear down on its three legs and feet called spud cans. And completing one of the new Tarzan spud cans, all 250 tons of it, is at the top of Bodie's to-do list. We want to make sure we got everybody that's involved in it knows what's going on. Once they finish building it, they'll try to lift it into this hole in the hull, where a leg will be assembled on top of it. But lifting and placing spud cans are the heaviest and most dangerous maneuvers of the entire build. You know, anytime you're handling that kind of load, if you had a mishap of a load falling, it could be pretty dangerous and fatal in some cases. Today, three days before the scheduled lift, Here to come. Here to come. Here to come. the crew is working feverishly to finish welding the spud can. The first flood can is supposed to be set on the 14th of June. And if we make that date or beat that date, we're, we're doing okay. But if we start falling behind, the only way to compensate is to 
work more hours and work overtime, which costs more money. Money is number one on Bodie's mind. He remembers when a recession shut down the shipyard in 92. Come on, here, get on this road. The folks here fear it could happen again. When we did close, it uh, certainly caused a lot of hardship on our local employees. It's hard on all of us at the time. A lot of us had, had 30 something years with the company. When, when I heard that we were getting laid off, it was a blow because I'd never been without a job. As far as uh, getting laid off, it was something completely new to me. It's almost like getting fired, but it, it was quite a shock. After three long years, the shipyard came back with a sharp new focus on the bottom line. But then, on the first Tarzan rig... We were running way behind schedule and we had to work a lot of extra overtime and brought in a lot of contract labor to try to compensate uh, meeting the time schedule. So Bodie needs to cut millions of dollars off this rig's bottom line. Hey, John! Production manager Bodie Massey is one heck of a general. And he came up through the ranks. I've been working here 23 years, and I welded right beside a lot of these guys. What's going on, Earl? And I know they're wives or kids or we're like a family. Nah, you won't hurt it. I won't hurt it. Nah, you doing all right? I'm doing pretty good. Yeah. This spud can lift is going to be his biggest challenge so far on this build. Maybe we're going to go 36 foot to have two more out. Everything seems to be running according to plan. Until Hello. Yeah, what's going on, eh? An emergency in the Gulf of Mexico has shut down drilling on one of their rigs. And only Bodie can fix it. All right, well, let me start getting something going. All right, back. Got a problem, a mechanical problem that we've had uh, one prior, and it's got production shut down. And he's asking myself come out and look at the problem, see if I can fix it. Aren't you needed here? Well, I am, but there's times that I have to go. Bodie's absence is not good news. He's going to be missed. This is his yard. These are his people. And it just means that all of the supervisors, all of the various supervisors he has, just have to pick it up a notch. They just have to step up a little bit. Someone has to direct the spud can lift. We're about ready for a little meat. The burden falls on Tom Smith. One set up the air tugger, Roy, you, you watch them. I got different ones I need. He's never headed up a lift like this before, but he's a 20-year veteran of the yard. I need you on standby to go up and maybe unhang it off of a wall. Tom's a man of few words. Everything went good, so, yeah. If Tom's nervous, he's not showing it. Mike, I guess the hardest thing we got going is those legs for Global Santa Fe. Now, With Bodie gone, head honcho Donald Cross is on edge. Tom, we're on schedule now to set that tank next Monday. If the weather permit, we'd be ready, you know, move it and get it ready for Monday, but I don't know what the weather, I hadn't seen the weather forecast. Well, I just brought the weather up on the computer back there, and it doesn't look good. 
pretty nasty looking. A lot of rain anyway. Looks like Tom's in for some sleepless nights. His first task is to make sure the workers finish building the spud can on time. Yeah, he got one more thing to bring in. He got to come right through here. Aside from the tight schedule, Tom's worried about the storm heading toward Vicksburg. And then there's... The mosquitoes around here, they get, they get pretty bad. They, they big ones, little ones, and when they go to bite, they can leave whips on you pretty good, especially down here by the Mississippi River. But right now, their worst enemy is the heat. Out here, it's 90 degrees. Inside the spud can, temperatures can hit 140. Sometimes it can get unbearably hot in there. You have to, you have to come out, get cooled off, go back in, you know, work as long as you can. After eight weeks of welding, the interior is done. Now they've got to put the lid on it. Well, there's a segment of the spud can top that is rigged up. It's hanging right here, and we're fixing to pick it up lay it in place and start fitting it in and trimming it in. In his off hours, project manager Hugh Smith's a cowboy with a stable full of horses. So roping a three-ton piece of the roof should be no problem for him and his crew. But... run out of fuel. got a crane that's run out of fuel. And we've got guys that's, you know, supposed to check things so that in the morning, here it is, it's almost 9 o'clock, got a lift to make over on the slab, and the crane's down. Finally, the tank is full. But with a three-ton slab dangling overhead, there's no room for more mistakes. material and all of these beams that you see have got to fit and line up so it's just a lot of fitting and it's a lot of trimming to get it worked down in there it'll take hours to get it right and that is just one panel 
on one spud cam. Meanwhile, across the yard, another crew is building the rig's three legs. Each leg is a web of 576 joints of pipe. The entire weight of the rig rests on its legs. So a crack in any of the joints could be disastrous. Only the best welders get to work on the legs. The job requires powerful biceps and a macho disregard for burns. Getting it right sometimes takes a woman's touch. The hold up. <laughs> I've never been in front of a camera before. I don't know. Okay. It's a lot of weight that has to go on these legs. And they have to have a good weight. I mean, I don't want to be out there with a bad wheel. It's hot, dangerous work. With nowhere to hide from the spray of sparks. Well, you can look at this shirt and tell I done got burned a few times. Yeah, and when you do get burned, it do hurt. Don't think it don't hurt. It really hurts. And it's severe, but you, you shake it off and keep on going. They attach each leg piece to the structure like a massive erector set. So look at there, it's a perfect fit. Good fit. Take all the pipes in just one leg, lay them end to end, and they'd span 30 football fields. This week, the spud can lift is the main event. But the Tarzan's looming launch date has all the crews hustling. This structure is one wall of the living quarters. The future home to dozens of drillers, roughnecks, and roustabouts. It may be hard to believe, but this is going to be the quarters building for the rig when it's operating offshore. It's got a full galley and mess room for feeding all these people. It's got recreation room offices, control room, and cabins to house all these people. We're going to cut a piece of pipe and glue it up. It's a little different from the rest. To Chief Engineer Mike Dowdy, each part of this raw space has meaning. This will be the galley and storeroom. The mess room is through here. Well, now you can smell the welding process going on. When you get to offshore, it'll smell like fried fish and steaks and baked potatoes. But his Tarzan is still a long way from serving up grub. And Tom Smith is spread thin covering for Bodie. He's got more on his mind than spud cans. Like this piece of the hull's inner wall, the last line of defense in a collision with a ship. If the outer wall is breached, the inner wall will hold back the sea. Might, might have to swing just a little bit. Move it down a little bit, Tyrant. This is going to be a little harder piece to fit because it's tying in two other pieces that's already there. It may take us two hours to get it in place, and it may take two days to get it in place. 
the seal will have to be watertight. Hey, Clem. Bake you up something on that end and pick that end up to make it pick this whole wall up. Yeah, make it uh, level up and it come in here easier. They're having trouble with the fit. These handles will have to go. More adjusting and readjusting. My toy line over here too. Inch by inch. After a 10 hour day, the team heads home. But the work can't stop. The night crew will keep the torches burning until nearly dawn. Out at sea, a rig is a fortress, surrounded by sharks and barracuda, assaulted by hurricanes vulnerable to fire. The rig itself is a tangled mass of smoldering steel this morning, split down the middle by the powerful explosion. Lives literally depend on how well the rig is constructed. This gorilla class rig is a stronghold designed to endure in the harshest environments. A 32,000 ton monster that can hunt down oil seven miles below the seafloor. You ready to drill? Go ahead, real quick. Everyone on the rig is there to support this single activity. A tungsten carbide drill searching below the seabed for black gold. The drill churns up gravel and sand, which is jettisoned back into the sea, leaving a long white trail. Okay, look, we're pumping a weighted, pumping a weighted sweep right now. Until they hit oil, they will work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Up to 120 of them, all working and sleeping here. <laughs> 10.30, man. 10.30, wake up, dog. And every day begins with a visit from little Joe Odom. 10.30, my man. Well, he's not fully dressed, so... You're not filming these guys in their shorts, are you? Nope. 10.30, my man. 10.30. I... 10.30 may sound like a late start, but these men won't get off until midnight. It's sweaty, back-breaking work. What I'm saying is I may have to back my pumps off. Two straight weeks of 12-hour days. Everything out here is a major production. Even taking out the trash. Mm. 
but there are compensations. You get good money, got the two weeks off, do what you want. Most people only have two weeks vacation a year. We get it every month. And there's the four-star food. We have steak, french fries, barbecue, chicken. We have chili sauce, we have mushrooms, we have sautéed onions. Plus we have the full salad bar. Always stop. The steaks are grilled to order. Because the last thing the company wants is a mutiny over lousy grub. These guys are like family. We spend so much time together. We spend half our life together out here. So, if, you know, we're going to get close to each other. We look out for each other. We kind of like brothers. Does your wife tell you she wants you to move back on shore? No, my wife likes for me to uh, stay out here. <laughs> the more I stay out here, the better off we are. She likes it. But for a lot of them, the distance from home is a real hardship. I just had a kid, though. I just got back from the hospital. I had, they sent me in for um, three days to let me be with my girlfriend while she was having a baby. I got to hold them for about 25 minutes, and I had to come back. To keep Mike Duran's the boss of the rig the equivalent of a ship's captain. As you can see in here, it looks a lot like my house, needs picking up a little bit. <laughs> but I've got uh, pictures of my family, my wife, my little girl. Oh, I missed it. All right, Shug. You gotta get you some sleep sometime tonight. <laughs> All right, sweet. I love you, Daddy Top D and Ma. Bye-bye, Shug. I think all the guys who've been here any length of time get familiar with it. You get to where you feel like this is as much home as what your home is. The rig may be home, but everyone knows there's danger all around. Oil is extremely flammable, and the nearest emergency room is 100 miles away. Everything we do these days, we like to do it safely, because human lives are so much more important than anything that we could do out here. And lives have been lost on oil rigs. Offshore oil rigs caught fire and exploded during 16 the workers are confirmed dead there. More than 150 are missing, and they are presumed to have suffered from burns when an explosion tore the oil platform apart. This is a drill. This is a drill. I reported it to Elkport. Our team control room. If a fire breaks out on the rig, there's nowhere to run. And if it rages out of control, the crew's only chance for survival is evacuation. If we didn't have these drills and, and the real thing really did happen, an evacuation situation, they wouldn't know what to do. So. Safety is the number one priority out here. In an emergency, these high-tech lifeboats, each equipped with a satellite beacon, can hold and feed 50 people. But the best defense is the rig's construction. Our lives are totally dependent on how this structure is made. But these legs are so tough that if a boat runs into it, I've seen many boats 
that when they hit them, they were torn up, and I hadn't seen damage to a leg yet. A strong rig is a safe rig. This is it, man. My baby. My other woman. Designing strong rigs is the job of Chief Engineer Mike Dowdy. He's at home on a rig. But his real home is on land with his engineers. And then we relocated this access hole to a blue. Thousands of lives depend on their calculations. Structure during the course of the project. So let's take a look at the 250 foot water depth case. All right, I got this one set up to be about. The team foot subjects a virtual Tarzan to a virtual storm. The geometry of your model is accurate and the stiffness of the hull to lay connections. They're analyzing the effects of a 40-foot wave. So that's what it's going to look like. They've designed the rig to sway in a high wind, just like a skyscraper. Should be able to show you some joint deflections here. This is exaggerated. I've got a scale factor of 35. Yeah, that's great. It's better to bend than to break. Back in the shipyard, the engineer's equations dictate the thickness of the steel for the hull, which grade of steel to use, and how to build a leg that won't buckle. Mike Dowdy keeps refining the design. It's repeated so many times in the leg structure. That, that in the yard, Mike can see his calculations in action. Well, look here. What do you got out here? This area right in here is what I'd like to see if we can't take some of this off. But this There's always a tug of war between engineering and construction. But if we do what you're talking about, I ain't going to have no room for air. I think we can do a better job than this, though. Two inches of excess material. But Mike can learn a lot from a shipyard veteran like Mike Dotson. Fish plate happened to be off center just a little or leaning just a little. They don't mind telling you how they see it, you know. So you have to get used to, to constructive criticism. It's not just design that dictates safety. Now you got an inch and a quarter right there. It's also the quality of the steel. To control quality, the company makes its own. This is the hottest place on the property. Temperatures in the furnace approach 3,000 degrees. Chemical compounds help strengthen the steel. This 27 ton ingot is being pressed into a plate of steel just six inches thick. Thousands of plates required to make a rig are cut with a 2800 degree torch. This is the cut shop and all the parts that go into the components of the rig are originated in this shop and they're cut here. If it's not right here, if it's not cut properly here, if the material analysis is not right here, then when it gets into the yard, onto the slab, 
into the spud can, it becomes a nightmare. And that's just what these guys don't need. Especially as Tom prepares to take on the most dangerous lift. It's just two days to the big spud can lift. You can go around that way, but put it on a very... Bodie Massey is still away, and the pressure is getting to Tom. Hey, y'all come down the ladder where you can pull on it. There's that storm heading straight for Vicksburg. Sun's shining right at the moment, but... Uh... It could come up a cloud and go to rain in. Tom wants to clean and prep the spud can before the storm hits. But he's got to wait for a green light from these guys. Quality control. A flaw in the can would be catastrophic as one of the Tarzan's three feet, it will bear more than 3,000 tons. That's the weight of 160 Sherman tanks. First, they dust the welds with metallic powder. Running a magnet over the powder makes it gather at gaps in the welds, revealing any surface cracks. To find cracks below the surface, they need the ultrasonic testing graph. It's an ultrasound check similar to uh, sonar, where it, you know it, it sends a sound out and it picks up a defect and it sends it back. If there are cracks, the QC team will hunt them down. They'll inspect every single weld on the rig. And there are literally millions of them. So this weld is acceptable. It is good. It takes hours, but the QC team finally gives its okay. Tom's crew starts tearing everything they no longer need off the top of the spud can. can get dangerous. Most of the time you don't want to think about it. You just do your job. You just do what you can. Keep yourself safe and keep everybody else as safe as you can. They're 30 feet off the ground. A fall from here could kill a man. Y'all ready? Tom's plan is to lift the spud can off its support braces and lower it to the riverbank so they can clean the bottom before lifting it into the hull. Skater got some help on that side. First, they've got to tie the can to the cable of a towering crane. Okay, Thomas, let's start easing back down. The can weighs more than a 747. If the rigging isn't right, the spud can could turn into a widowmaker real fast. It can be very dangerous with the weight that we're picking up, and we do it carefully. We, we take our time, don't get in no hurry with what on a, on a lift like this. Then, with 250 tons overhead, the crew knocks out the support braces. The only thing keeping the can from crushing the workers and our anxious cameraman is the strength of the rigging. The crane holds, but their luck doesn't.
the storm suddenly strikes. Tom has no choice but to scrap the lift for today. Which means time and money down the drain. By the next morning, the storm has passed. Yeah, it's pretty funky. Let's, let's go back that way. Dusty one day and muddy the next. By afternoon, it's 92 degrees. And the ground is bone dry. Tom's anxious to make up for lost time. Y'all ready? Bodie's still away, so Tom turns for help to another shipyard veteran. I ready, Jay. Jerry Spites taught Tom everything he knows. And after 38 years in the yard, there's not much Jerry doesn't know. Our weather's good, and it ain't gonna get no better. <laughs> Roy, you ready? I'm all ready. All right, Tom, let's start easing up. At its widest, the spud can covers more than 1,300 square feet. Oh, and easy to the right. That's one big, ugly foot. Okay, Thomas, let's uh, easy there and uh, boom up where you get enough room to ease it down right there. We need to come back this way a little bit. Might be good right here we come down on it. The eagle has landed. Our crane operator made another beautiful lift. Did y'all witness? Now they'll be able to clean the bottom of the can before lifting it into the hull. We'll do the rest of our grinding and get it ready to sit. All right. This was an easy lift compared to tomorrow's mission. In Vicksburg, it's time to head home. But out in the Gulf of Mexico, the Gorilla 6 is home. With no alcohol and no women, crew member Zazak Daguchazi has to find something to do. Maybe tomorrow will be a better day. Today's the big day. Tom and his crew will attempt to lift the spud can and inch it into the yoke. 
The yoke is a hole in the hull that functions as a sleeve for the spud cannon leg to pass through. They'd be better off in that metal one anyway. The lift sounds straightforward, but in reality, it's an incredibly precise operation. Positioning a 250 ton hunk of steel with only millimeters to spare. There's uh, three sets of guides on the inside of that yoke, and it's real important that that can, when we start dropping that spud can down, that it lines up in, inside of all of those guides. Well, we don't have to have it, so we need that one. Put them in that one. Tom Smith is willing to admit he's worried. It'll make you nervous when you're picking up 500,000 pounds. Come on, Tom is. Now Tom has to rely on crane operator Thomas Richardson. Well, I do get nervous every now and then, when, uh, especially when you have to take the crane to its limit. Anytime I pick them up, like that for my life, I'm like in my hand. With 15 years of heavy lifting under his belt, he's the best man for the job. It's a 529,000 pound lift, and this is crane has got an excessive amount of capacity for this lift. However, as is always the case on any lift, there are always issues that are unforeseen and things could occur. All right, we're getting ready to make this lift here. Tom goes over the battle plan. All right, we're gonna be careful. We're gonna take our time. Thomas, we're gonna ease it up, and take it real slow and easy, and uh, have a safe lift here this morning. Every time we get ready to make a big lift, it, uh, we all pretty got a little itchy, nervous, and to make sure everything goes well that nobody gets hurt. Including the camera crew. You're gonna be filming this lift of the spud can, and Tom and Jerry have insist that you be in the basket, in the crane, out of the way. The camera crew knows better than to argue. Okay, here we go. And we have liftoff. You got too much pull on it, Greg. Tom watches from one angle. Come all around here. While Jerry looks on from a more precarious position. Everything pretty calm there. Tom is just easy around him, right? Getting close there, Tom, just a little bit further. down there. That cord right there has got to come in the center of that box. Watch your tuggers, Roy, because we're going to be uh, booming down. That's almost easy to drive. Just a little bit. Yeah, it looks like you need to bump off over here. Let's just hold what we got just a minute. Let me rock the more thing to the left. Okay, Tom, it's easy right just a little bit. I got my plate there started in the top guy. When the spud can touches the yoke, Jerry sees that something's gone wrong. They've forgotten to close the manhole covers. And they're hanging over the side. Yeah, let me put these lids on. I don't want to take a chance tearing them up. With the covers jutting out, the spud can won't fit. Woo! Somebody 
like a crest crazy, y'all. Come on up. We just overlooked the manhole covers. The next one we'll have the lids out the way. You learn the hard way. With the manhole covers wrestled into place, Thomas begins lowering the spud can inch by inch into the yoke. Yeah, just keep it snug. Don't let it get too tight. Ease down on your wings just a little bit. I think we're hitting something. All right, hold what you got, Greg. The can is too close to the edge. Right, Jerry, too far that way. Thomas guides it over the bullseye. Okay, hold that. Easy down, just a little. Finally, the spud can touches down. Good job. Mission accomplished. <laughs> so it went well? Went well. Went well. Another good lift. What y'all do just the ordinary work day. The next day, Bodie returns from the Gulf of Mexico. Successful job, yeah. Yeah, I got the rig back up and running, and they went back to drilling. Every day, there's fires that have to be put out. 30 to 26. Come in, Tom. Bodie's pleased with Tom's work, but he's ready to take charge again. Let's do it, guys. They'll need two cranes and a lot of muscle to heave this leg piece on top of the spud tank. Pull on it over, Bernie. Pull on. This giant skeleton is only one of 49 pieces that will make up a leg. in position, ready to be welded. Yeah, everything went real smooth and real good. Didn't take but probably less than uh, 20 minutes. Bodie's back in action, and Tom had a great week. It's time to party. <laughs> Beer is cold and the music is homegrown Delta Blues. This crew's got a lot to celebrate. After days on the rig, Bodie and his wife are getting reacquainted. While the boss was away, Tom wrangled in the spud can with time to spare. Tom did Bodie proud. And so far, they're still on budget. was a success, but they still have a long way to go. If all goes well, next April, 
the Tarzan will walk to the Mississippi, travel down the river, and take its place among the hundred jack-up rigs in the Gulf of Mexico. But until that day, Bodie and his men must fight to stay on schedule. Watch it. And steer clear of disaster. Yeah, I worry about it some at night. Try not to worry about it too much because I plan on doing this type of work for a long, long time. And too much worrying can get you. So far, Bodie's attitude has served him well. In 10 months, his men should finish this powerful drilling machine. A rig that will help win the race for deep oil in the Gulf of Mexico.